In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I I don't usually give titles to my sermons, and we don't have one of those signboards out in front where you can add the titles of the sermons week by week, but I I did think I would call this one, if we had one of those signboards, I would call it The Two Economies. The Two Economies. I I was thinking about that. I was, uh, for about three years before I went to seminary, I taught history and government uh, uh, to a group of 10th graders, and we had a, a, a course interesting course called Introduction to Social Studies. Kind of pretty, pretty broad task. And in that we had a, I remember, a 10 or 12 week unit that was an introduction to economics, to sort of the classical uh, uh, introduction to, to the discipline of economics, supposed to, to whet the appetites of 10th graders for uh, more formal study later, I guess. Uh, but I, I do remember tr- trying to, to center the conversation about just what economics is, what we were talking about. And we would always begin about uh, talking in the most basic way about what is valued, about what is important, what is valued and important to us individually uh, or as a society. What are, are the things that we want to have or want to experience? And then how do we as individuals, how do we as societies organize our lives and our behaviors, our thoughts and our feelings, our interactions with one another uh, in reference to what we value, what's important to us. And uh, Jesus has been talking economics for the last couple of chapters as he has uh, been standing out uh, in front of the house of the chief Pharisee of the neighborhood, speaking with the crowd and the disciples and this little cluster of scribes and Pharisees who had invited him to a Sabbath dinner. Uh, And as we uh, heard last week and really occupying the total uh, 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, uh, he has talked about uh, a certain kind of economic picture. Uh, He had three parables that we looked at, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son, and uh, those economies are in contrast now with the economy that we see represented uh, in the parable that Dan has just read for us at the beginning of the 16th chapter. Uh, in chapter 15, in those first three parables, uh, we, we heard about what was important from God's point of view, and now Jesus is offering uh, an alternative, and he asks the question about whether it's really possible for people to live within those two economies at the same time, or, as he says, whether it is possible for us to serve two masters. Uh, A few years ago, I saw a bumper sticker. It seemed a little bit out of time and place to me, but really capturing the spirit of the roaring 1990s. So maybe it was an old bumper sticker. Uh, But it said, he who dies with the most toys wins. He who dies with the most toys wins. And there's an implicit irony in there, of course. It's intended to elicit a smile from us uh, while calling some kind of attention to a system of value that we would say is centered on consumerism. Toys. Fancy cars, fancy houses, widescreen TVs, designer purses, shiny jewelry, exotic travel. How do I know that I have a successful life? Well, just look what's in my driveway. As a contrast, I remember sitting years ago with a great friend and teacher, the late Ken Bailey, brilliant New Testament scholar. He was our canon theologian here in the diocese for many years. He was talking about the passage in the 21st chapter of the Revelation to John, where John has his vision of the heavenly Jerusalem. 
Uh, the city is brilliant and shimmering and shining. Its walls and its gates are dazzling with the glitter of the rarest gems and jewels. Its streets are paved with gold. And he read through the, the poetry of those verses and paused as we would take that all in, a sort of a, a daydream of a resort destination more extravagant than any ever seen in a full-page ad in the New York Times magazine. And then Dr. Bailey said, so here's John's point. In God's kingdom, gold is just asphalt. Glittering jewels are just dumped in together with gravel and sand to be mortar for the bricks. Everything that seems to us to be so precious, there it doesn't count for anything. It's of no importance. It has no value at all. What we value the most, they pave their streets with in heaven. Turns out it's the presence of God that gives the city its glorious luster. The rocks are just rocks. So, so two contrasting economies, again, two masters, uh, the world as it is and the economy of the kingdom. Uh, the shepherd who leaves the 99 to seek after the one, the woman who caters a dinner dance for half the county to celebrate her finding of a lost coin of modest value, the father who puts aside pride and status and privilege to bring about forgiveness and reconciliation. Jesus goes on to tell the story then that we heard this morning about a manager who hasn't been very good at his job. The owner of the business has finally had enough of his incompetence and one afternoon sends him an email, come to my office first thing tomorrow morning. Now, as soon as the manager reads this, he knows his goose is cooked. The axe is about to fall, and he goes into panic. He's got a mortgage. He's got two kids in college, a leased European sedan. He and his wife already have non-refundable tickets for their European spring vacation, and they're up to their eyeballs and credit card debt. They've been financing a lot of toys. What's he going to do? And suddenly this idea hits him. It's a stroke of genius. He pulls the accounts receivable file. He calls a couple of his big customers. He offers them major discounts on all their outstanding invoices. They are delighted. They thank him profusely. And he is crossing his fingers that this newfound goodwill may open a few doors for him if he's out pounding the pavement looking for a new job in the next month or so. But the twist comes at the end of the story. The owner of the business goes online and sees what the manager has done. We think at first he might be outraged, but actually it's quite the contrary. The morning comes, the manager is welcomed to the owner's office, not with a pink slip, but with a, a smile and a handshake, a cigar, and a promotion. That's exactly the kind of outside-the-box thinking we need around here to take our business to the next level, the owner exclaims. I've been looking to hire somebody new who could be a, a real game-changer for us around here, somebody who could think on his feet, and here you are, right under my nose all along. Not afraid to take risks. Not afraid to push the edge of the envelope. The world is full of paper pushers, he says, but you've really shown me something different. You've got real potential. And I for sure don't want you going out to work for one of my competitors. Jesus says, you know, there are an awful lot of people around here who have been very successful in the he who dies with the most toys wins economy, like the characters in this story. Uh, they've got the game figured out. They're experts. We expect to read about them both very soon in the cover story of Business Week or Barron's. 
They know with crystal clarity which master they are serving, and they're good at it. Jesus looks at the crowd. He looks at his disciples. He looks at the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, how about us? What would it be like if folks around here were to be as skillful as these guys in the other economy? Skillful in transactions about grace and mercy and love. This turns out to be an uncomfortable moment for the scribes and Pharisees, as we've heard, and it's really going to come to a boil with next Sunday's reading, but, but uh, they know they're supposed to be ambassadors of God's kingdom in the midst of God's people, but apparently they're better known right now at the Nordstrom's than they are at the local soup kitchen or food pantry. They know more about how to make small talk at cocktail parties than they do about sitting and praying with their neighbors in times of need. So they're, they're getting kind of fidgety. You know, looking at the question, the contrast that Jesus is pointing to this morning is actually the deeper spiritual and theological invitation of ordinary year-to-year work of parish annual stewardship campaigns. Or, or it would be, anyway, that, that conversation, that question when we do it right, which I'm not always sure we do either here at St. Andrews or most places in the wider church. But, but what we would be doing if we were doing it in a way shaped by Scripture and in this place, be thinking about our lives in terms of what the stewardship of the new economy is really all about, the economy of heaven. Actually, this is a parenthesis, I think our vestry is leading us into some very substantial conversations about that this year. But the central point is not about raising money to fund a church budget, although uh, while we live in this world, budgets will always need to be funded, but, but about how the disciplines of tithing and of offering of the first fruits of our time, talent, and treasure are exercises in helping us navigate the transition from one economy to the other to build up our spiritual character, to help us become more acclimated to the economy of heaven. Jesus isn't talking about tweaking the present system. You wouldn't need to go to the cross to do that. You could just write a book or have your TED Talk go viral on social media. But he's talking instead about something as old as the first hour of creation, yet for us also radically different and radically new. An economy of grace where the currency of compassion and forgiveness and humility and obedience, joy and generosity begin to replace the gold and jewels and glittering prizes of this world. Uh, A world in which a fragment of bread and a sip of wine become a banquet far above any earthly feast, working a deep change in us to prepare us in heart and mind to see and to know and to love and to dwell forever in the brightness and beauty of the city God has prepared for us himself in Jesus. Grant us, O Lord, not to mind earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, as we are placed among things that are passing away, to cleave to those that shall abide.